Okay, so this is the second video in your Unit 3 module. Here we're going to be talking about uh, chemical bonds, specifically the types of bonds that we're going to be dealing with, and really getting us set up for uh, chemical formulas and nomenclature. So here we're going to be looking specifically at the different types of bonds, and that's going to lead us into the more detailed organization here. So remember the whole point of forming a molecule, the whole point of atoms doing anything is they really want to get to that noble gas configuration. And when that happens, they are going to be much more stable, much more happy, okay? Now, the way that they're going to form, uh, the way they're going to get to that noble gas configuration is by making a bond with other atoms. Now, these molecules are going to have no net charge. We're going to deal with polyatomic ions in a minute. They have a charge. A true molecule is neutral. It is not going to have a charge there. They're also going to behave as one. They're going to be a single unit, and they're going to have properties based off the fact that they are a unit. Um, if you, uh, I can't think of an example right now, um, but it's kind of like pairing up on an assignment. You're a terrible speller, they're bad at math, but as a unit, that group assignment is going to be awesome because you have a good speller and you have somebody that's good at math, something like that. Um, so molecules are going to be forming really just to make that nice stable aggregate to get everybody that noble gas configuration to keep everyone happy. Woohoo! Now, for us, there are two types of bonds. We are going to be dealing with covalent bonds and with ionic bonds. Now, you can probably already imagine covalent, cohabitate, co-work, co-workers, co means cooperate. Um, this is together. So this is going to involve two or more nonmetals. And they're going to be sharing electrons. They're going to be working together, sharing electrons so that they can both reach that stable noble gas configuration, eight electrons. Now, because nonmetals like fluorine are going to have um, similar electronegativities, they are going to want to uh, share electrons. So if we kind of look, I'm going to do some color coding here. Fluorine was in group 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and just for simplicity's sake there. Um, Color-wise, let's do, let's do blue. I try not to choose pink for everything, even though I really want to. Another 7 valence electrons. So this guy is missing one here. This guy is missing one here. And so what happens, can I select, or is that just on my other one? Yep, I have to rewrite it. Um, so if, what happens is these guys are going to come together and make a bond where that's way too far away. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This fluorine now has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. This fluorine now has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. And so a lot of the time you're going to see this written as like a bond with just a dash. Sometimes they'll put the valence electrons um, around. Um, sometimes they, they won't, but they should. Uh, it just depends. Now, um, this is a way that they are sharing electrons. Now, when we say they have a similar electronegativity, it means that these guys have a similar desire for electrons. They have a similar ability to pull those electrons but towards them. So if we were to expand this bond way out, and I'm not going to write the valence electrons here for simplicity's sake, but the electrons are going to be equally pulled, if I could draw just right, um, between these two atoms, okay? And so they're equal distance. They're being shared. And so these are going to be electrons that are shared between um, two nonmetals, okay? So if you see a, two nonmetals forming a bond, it is 
a covalent bond. Now, guys, we can go back and relate this. If you kind of think about the electron configuration in, that we discussed in um, unit two, here, oops, nope, sorry. Why isn't it pulling up? My image is gone. Oh, here we go. If we think about the electron configuration of fluorine, we know that it's got these seven valence electrons. We just drew them as, you know, we don't care about the, the 1s, we only care about the valence. We drew them like this. Now, it's the same as thinking about those orbitals, thinking about the electron configuration itself. And we can see there's a hole right here, there's a hole um, right here. Really, this should be aimed up, but it's a matter of um, proving a point in the reading. Um, they can share an electron. This one can go here, this one can go there. And all of a sudden, they both have eight electrons because of that sharing. Now what that's really going to do is it's going to mean that the protons in this nucleus are going to be attracted to the electron from this atom and then the protons in this guy's nucleus are going to be attracted to the electron from this guy. Okay, And so that's really going to be what holds them together. It's not the electron sitting there because electrons technically re repel each other. They're the same charge. They don't want to sit next to each other. What's really holding these atoms together is the attraction between the nucleus and the neighboring atoms electron. Now, for the most part, when we talk about covalent compounds, we're going to be dealing with binary, meaning they have two nonmetals. Now, remember, mm, you can't see because I've got my screen cut down. Nonmetals are really just this green segment. And so when we're talking about covalent compounds, we are going to be writing only compounds that contain these guys. Now, the other reason that I wanted to discuss electronegativity again in this unit is because of the way uh, you write these compounds. It comes about that the, the rule is that you have to write the least electronegative atom first. And so that means usually you're going to write the one that's closest to uh, fluorine first. The only exception is hydrogen because hydrogen should be right there. So C and O, when they bond, oxygen is closer to fluorine, so we're going we're gonna to write carbon first. CO is carbon monoxide. CO2 is carbon dioxide. And so the reason that uh, covalent compounds are, you know, kind of fun to work with is that the same two elements can bond multiple different ways. Uh, carbon dioxide is relatively harmless. It's good for plants. You know, we breathe it out all the time. Carbon monoxide all of a sudden is super toxic and, you know, kills on a regular basis. Same thing can happen, you know, down here. We can talk about laughing gas. We can talk about nitrogen dioxide. There's a number of ways that these elements can bond together. But as long as it's just two nonmetals, it is going to be um, a covalent compound. Okay? So how do you recognize if a compound is covalent? Hit pause and really think about it. Make sure you're with me before we continue. The only answer to this is two or more nonmetals. Oops. And there is, you know, for it to be a compound, it can't have a charge, so it's got to be neutral. Mm, EU, I think. Okay. Now, ionic bonds are the other type of bonds. These are going to be um, an attraction, a bond is, that forms between two different ions. You're going to have a cation, which is going to have a positive charge, and a negatively charged ion, which is also called an anion. Now, I think, you know, this is kind of interesting how you try to remember this. 
Um, when I tried to remember, you know, well, cation means positive charge, I tried to think, well, I mean, I guess if you like cats, cats are positive, they're good. Um, you know, I do, I like cats, they just, they really don't like me. Um, so, you know, wh whatever. Uh, negatively charged anions, those are easier for me to remember. Annoying, angry, uh, antagonistic, stuff like that. Um, that prefix means bad things, so negative. So an ion is an, is an entity. It's either going to be a single atom or a group of atoms that are bonded together that have a net charge. They are going to usually form um, to get to the noble gas configuration. So like sodium, which ends in um, 3s1, neon 3s1, it'll just lose this one electron to be neon and make Na+. Um, if you write this in math editor, do not put a 1 here. Um, if you have something like magnesium where you've got a 2 plus charge, make sure the number comes before the sign. Okay. Now, um, monoatomic ions, mono means 1, atomic means atom. So these are going to be something like this, sodium or magnesium, just a single entity. Um, polyatomic ions are something like the, um, let's do phosphate, the phosphate ion. Um, these five atoms bonded together with an overall charge, okay? But the idea here is you have positive charges and negative charges. It is the attraction, the electrostatic interaction here that is going to hold those ions together. And um, these are really strong bonds because there's they're able to kind of sit next to each other and um, like this guy is interacting with multiple, this one's interacting with multiple. And so it's really a stable kind of complex here. So ionic bonds form between a metal and a nonmetal or something with a polyatomic ion, okay? And so here it's going to be something like NaCl, metal, nonmetal or um, HNO3, polyatomic ion, and another atom. So acids, bases, metal, nonmetal, um, anything with a polyatomic ion, these are all ionic compounds, okay? Um, for these, the cation is always written first. It's going to be the one that has the lowest electronegativity. It's going to be the one that does not want electrons. Cation is written first. So if we looked at something like sodium and fluorine, let me see here. Um, I don't want to write over the image, so we're going to draw over here. Na has is in group one. It has that one valence electron. Fluorine is in. Group seven, it's got seven valence electrons. And you can kind of remember this has got a hole here. This one technically can form a bond, but the idea is sodium doesn't really want electrons anyway. It would much rather give it up, so it's going to allow the high electronegativity of the fluorine to pull that electron over and really just, you know, kind of steal it over to the fluorine. Meanwhile, sodium's like, well, I didn't want it anyway, whatever. And um, that's going to give you, there's two ways that you typically write this. Um, the incorrect way or the less correct way is kind of like this, where you, oh, you have a bond. That's not really the way it's happening, though. Here we have Na+, and then fluorine, which has got its uh, eight valence electrons with an overall negative charge. Sometimes in your text, they'll put like brackets around it just to kind of keep it easy to see, but whatever. Now, if you look, the way that you can visualize this is sodium, as soon as fluorine comes into play, he's like, hey, can I have that? Sodium's like, yes, please. And um, they just kind of transfer ownership right there. Okay. Now, um, if we look at something like 
magnesium and chlorine. Magnesium is in group 2, so it's got two valence electrons. Chlorine is in group 7, so it has seven valence electrons. And so if we were to draw that, you have magnesium, which is really close to the noble gas configuration, just wants to give those electrons away. Chlorine is very close to fluorine. It's a, no, it's a non-metal with a high electronegativity. It wants those electrons. It pulls them towards it. So you end up getting a magnesium with a 2 plus charge and two chlorines that are going to form um, a negative charge and become chlorides. Now ionic compounds can also be binary, um, the first type. Um, type 1, and I try to be clear when I'm talking about these, but there's just so many ways that you can form an ionic charge, I mean, sorry, an ionic compound. The first is with a metal and a nonmetal. Now we can talk about more than one type of metal though. And show, keep. If we go up to, here we go. We can talk specifically, come on, about our main group elements. So our main group metals are the ones that are in these tall columns. Or we can talk about our transition metals. Remember, transition metals have charges that are variable. And these are um, things like uh, iron. They can be plus one, plus two. They can be plus three. Um, it just depends. And so because of that, also, see I'm shading under the metalloids here, 10 lead. Um, these are things that are treated as a transition metal in these compounds, OK? So if we're talking about just these main group metals, main group metals are going to be from group 1, 2, or 3 and not below the metalloids. Um, these have names like Na NaF would be sodium fluoride, K2O is potassium oxide, the subscript just means how many of each there is. So like there's two potassiums here and one oxygen ion. Um, it can also be between a transition metal with a nonmetal. So here FeO or Fe2O3. This is iron 2 oxide. We'll get into why in a minute. Iron 3 oxide. The thing here is we are specifying the charge. And so if you have a transition metal, you have a bit more of a name than anything else you have to worry about. You have to really worry about that charge and the name. You can also have a polyatomic ion. So whenever we're dealing with ionic compounds and you come across a polyatomic ion, the easiest thing to do is just to memorize them. And so here I've got potassium carbonate, potassium with the carbonate ion, ammonium oxide, Hydrogen peroxide, doesn't look like it, but this is a polyatomic ion. Hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, sulfurous acid. If you don't know these polyatomic ions, your life can be hard. Now looking at the number of you that are going into, uh, oh, the medical field and other health related fields. You really just need to know those polyatomic ions, but I'm going to give you a couple of shortcuts here in a second. So how do you know if a compound is ionic? Please hit pause and try to answer on your own. But the idea is you either have a metal plus a nonmetal. You can have uh, something, I'm going to say atom, plus a polyatomic ion. And also you're going to notice that even though the compound, oops, is neutral, but the ions each have charges. So like Na plus and F minus, it is this interaction that holds them together. 
plus and minus. Overall, it's neutral, and so you would just write NAF. Oops. Okay. Hopefully that kind of helps you recognize the types of bonds that there are. We are going to go ahead and move into the next video where we are going to um, really start to worry about the polyatomic ions. I'm going to show you some shortcuts to how to memorize that.